Thank you. Good evening. Indeed, I will tell you a little bit about some of the concepts that we have developed around Digital Identity 3.0. It's a bit academic, but I'll try not to make it too boring. Um, we've seen a lot of really good and compelling examples of what digital identity can do for you from Amy, and we've seen a lot of really good reasons for why it's important to have this. But I will try to summarize in a few five concepts what our understanding is of digital identity 3.0 and why it's important and what it should look like. Um, first of all, we've seen a lot of examples tonight about that shift in the economy to people. The 20th century was all about large corporations trying to get even larger, becoming more efficient, using methods such as Lean Six Sigma business process management. I'm sure you all know that. And in, into the 21st century, these companies still try to grow their value, and now more and more by collecting data, and then using that big data to crunch the numbers and to e make even more value out of customers. Everything was very much centered on large corporations. Now we see increasingly that people decentralized are creating value for themselves, and sharing that value amongst each other on platforms. And this is a major shift, and the, the sharing economy is something that I'm sure you've all heard of. And it's not some small little startup community that's, that is sharing stuff. It's really happening, and it, it represents a major shift, major shift in the economy. And it also means that people feel more empowered, and they also want to get power back over all that data that's out there in the hands of these corporations. That's why Digital Identity 3.0 is so important. And then also to protect the privacy of your little endeavors, of course, as we've seen today. Um, what is Digital Identity 3.0? As was described before, it's uh, by, by John, I believe, it's a, it's a private master record. It's your own record of who you are and anything that you want to store in it. But on top of that storage space, it allows you to do stuff with that data. And that's what Amy illustrated really well. It allows you to use that data or that information about yourself or anything that you want to share for any purpose that you want to use it for. And this image shows really well that the data comes back to the customer and is structured around the people in clusters that they can selectively share with different organizations. And we believe for Digital Identity 3.0 to really uh, help the economy of people reach its full potential, it has to have these five core characteristics. And most of them have actually been mentioned uh, literally or in illustrations today. I'll go through each of them in detail. But in short, we believe a digital identity 3.0, a platform for people, should be consumer empowered, obviously. It should learn effortlessly from your behavior, both physically and digitally. And that, that last question referred to that. You don't actively have to teach it. It learns automatically. Thirdly, it pulls proactive services towards you based on what it learns. Because it knows so, you so well, it can predict what you need in the future. Fourth, it's open. You can do anything that you desire, and you can add any type of data or attribute or use case to the platform. And fifth, it's connected. And obviously, you can't do much with all your data and your sharing if there's no one to share with. So it should connect you to the people around you and to your existing networks and new networks. Let's look at the first one briefly, consumer empowered. Uh, what, oh, sorry, I went too quick there. Consumer empowered means that people is, are in control and we've heard lots of uh, good arguments for that tonight. Um, and it also means that people, once they have full control over their data, can go to organizations with their own data. They can bring their data into transactions with organizations which means that organizations have to accept people's terms and conditions. And that also means that people can decide to stop sharing their data with a certain organization. And the organization would have to delete the data. And we saw a really nice example of Ashley Madison not doing that properly. Um, digital identity platform, it's, the reason why it's so important that it's owned and managed by people is exactly that. There is, of course, no really good way yet to make data uncopyable. So data can always escape your, your hands somehow. But Digital Identity 3.0 could give you the tools to manage it in the best possible way. And then it's up to the people to decide how much they share and with whom. The second element is that it's learning effortlessly from you. These days, there's hardly anything that doesn't leave a digital trace. If you take just the example of your smartphone and your credit card, for example, Based on just the input of those two devices, 
your digital identity could learn almost everything about you. It would know what you buy, so it would know, for example, which food you like. It would know which food you like to eat with whom, because it would know when you are with certain other people, if it connects you to those people. It would know um, the schedule for the next couple of months. It would know how often you exercise. It would know how many, um, how many times you will be exercising in the next couple of weeks, because it has access to your calendar. So it could basically predict that you'll gain weight. <laughs> and then, based on that prediction, by learning automatically from different streams of your life in an integrated way, it could predict these kind of trends happening, personalize services for you, and then proactively respond. It knows you'll gain weight, so what it'll do is, it'll try to schedule some time in your calendar for a bit of exercise, It'll cancel that dinner, dinner reservation that you made for the next evening, invite your friends over to your home, and show, let all the nice groceries, fresh vegetables arrive to your home in time. So proactive services, sorry, proactive services that come to you before you know you need them. And this sounds nice, but it's actually possible. All that data is there. The problem is the data is now in the hands of corporations and not you. So you can't use it to unlock these proactive services coming towards you. So corporations come to you. An example for the university would be, we would be able to tell you what you need to know before you know that you need to know it. So we would know which jobs you do. We would know what you studied. And based on that, we could tell you, your knowledge on innovation is outdated. You really need to take this design-led innovation course, especially because your next job will require these skills. So proactively, your digital identity can draw services towards you before you know you need them. The next element, that's four, I think, it's open. And open means it's independent, as we said before, and users can use it for whichever purpose they desire. That means that users also have to be able to add new data to the platform and new types of data. Not just fill in a new field, but specify a new field. Um, we see all these nice examples in the sharing economy. There is an app for finding people, well, actually, finding fruit and vegetable in fruit and vegetables in the gardens of people near you that is almost ready to eat. There's actually an app for that, right near me it's called. Um, there's an app for, um, well actually, Monica here had a nice example. She would like to have an app to share her wardrobe. Because she has friends with similar tastes, they could have three times as many dresses, and they would be sure that they would never be wearing the same dress to the same event. Beautiful example. <laughs> Thank you for that. So it's independent, users specify data to the point where they decide what kind of data is in the platform, and users do whatever they want with that data. And then finally, and most importantly, of course, it's connected. And connectedness is what's behind that, this is actually the key value driver of the sharing economy, and, and of all these small startups that suddenly become such huge organizations with such big value. Because when you can tap into people's network, you can achieve exponential growth. If you look at um, Instagram, for example, many apps exist that can apply a nice filter to your picture. That's not, e not, not so difficult to achieve. But Instagram was the one that successfully made it easy for you to share those pictures on any platform that you desired with any of your networks and it would have that little brand of Instagram in the bottom. So it actually tapped into your existing networks to create that exponential growth. That's what they call network effects. And when, pe when people say something goes viral, that's exactly what, happen what happens. People take something and share it on existing platforms with that whole network. And then in that network, some other people start doing the same. And exponentially, you get this big bang. So people would have to be able to bring their own networks into this system so that they can unlock entire new scenarios with all the people in their network. And of course, people also have this desire to connect with others. Um, and very often, the connectedness is based on people that are similar to you or people that have something that you desire, or organizations that have something you, you desire. And very often, it's a combination of both. People want to connect to others that are similar to them and that have something they, they desire. For example, Tinder is a really good example. Um, now, the connections between different digital identities could take many, many forms. Um, there's also an app. Uh, it's called um, Frenemies. 
It's basically to avoid people. <laughs> so you could tell your digital identity, I really don't like this person anymore, please keep me away and notify me when too near. <laughs> it really exists. So the connections between different identities could take any form again. That's the openness. So in very brief, we have five core characteristics. It's consumer empowered. It learns effortlessly and automatically and in an integrated way, which unlocks proactive services coming towards you. It's open that you can even share your wardrobe with your friends. And it's connected to all of your networks, which means you can do, hard, you can do basically everything. Now, this all sounds really nice, but of course it's not as easy. People have been talking about this for over 10 years, 15 years in fact. Um, and what the research has shown is that the key is to start small. If you look at most of the big platforms that are out there today, they started in a specific location, solving a specific problem, and adding a few nice things on the top. Look at Airbnb. It provided housing to people that came to an event in San Francisco at a very busy time of the year. And then on top of that, people got the, the really cultural experience. And it was also easier and cheaper. But that's what allowed it to grow so quickly. Within that confined space and niche, there was rapid growth. And then it started expanding outside of that. And that's typically how such platforms grow. The second one is collaborate. And that's a key one. And, and Amy talked about that a little bit as well. Um, the one who will provide this platform will have to be on really good grounds with governments, corporations, people, everyone. Because people can only use it for anything they desire to use it for if organizations work with them, if organizations allow them to bring their own data. And so that's why we think that, and that's why we work with Australia Post on this project, we think that it's either going to be one of these large and safe haven organizations like Australia Post that is on good terms with most corporations, with governments, with people, or it's going to be a startup or both, um, an organization that's non-threatening to others. And then the final one, as Amy said, listen to customers. People want experiences. People want things that excite them. That's the only way to drive adoption. There are so many apps in the App Store. The only way to stand out is not to solve a little problem or to solve a privacy issue. It's creating experiences for people that excite them and that make them want to use this platform and share it with friends. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. And thank you for sharing the uh, the, the beautiful future of digital identity and also the scary one. So, so I absolutely love that uh, my wife will be able to share wardrobes with her friends. That's, uh, that's good news for my wallet. Money uh, saved. <laughs> <laughs> and her wallet. Uh, this, uh, the, also the scary part, the robots canceling my, my dinner dates. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm, I'm up for this one. Uh, Willem, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, what Willem did not mention in his uh, uh, speech is that he is the author of the Digital Identity 3.0, uh, the platform for people report together with, uh, with, the, with our team. So he's the main author. We also have Professor Michael Rosman, who is, uh, who is the second author of the, uh, of the report. Uh, this uh, report should be in your inboxes right now. So we're the chair of digital economy. Uh, and if you check your email, there should be a link to it that was sent to you during the presentation. You can also access it uh, through the application that I told you about. Uh, let's have about two, three minutes for questions uh, uh, to Willem, and then I'll ask uh, all the speakers uh, uh, to, to come over here. So two, three questions. There's one over here. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm Scott Pinar, and I absolutely love um, you know, Digital Identity 3.0. As an organization, we develop training, and we believe that training should travel with you. you know, your whole career should travel with you. So absolute fan. What I'm concerned about, though, is, and I'd love to see if there's any research on, you know, what that does for us as a human race. I remember the day when I, I was in bed, uh, you know, sort of next to my wife, and I had an iPhone. I, I kind of got addicted to, you know, kind of <laughs> taking work to bed. And, you know, I, w I found the, the, the first ad advert for the, I the iPad, and I showed it to her with great excitement, and she said, uh, does that mean we're going to have a device that size in bed now? You know, so, <laughs> and that was all. We got over that, you know, and you know, these days say she brings her iPad to bed and you know, she's on Pinterest, great. Um, are you telling me that I'm going to have to have Frank in bed with us now? <laughs> and to extend that, am I going to have to have my Frank connect with her Frank so I can get to know her better? 
But on a more serious note, you know, what does, you know, from a, from a human impact, you know, what, what's going to happen to our relationships and, and how is that thought of or counted in, in the same process? That's a very good question. Thank you. We wouldn't want you to sleep with a robot. Now, um, what is interesting about this shift from the economy to, of corporations to economy of people is that a lot, a lot of what the value that's being created is created locally and in search for reconnecting to local communities. I mentioned that app of Ripe Near Me. There's another app that, that, that's, um, I don't know the title, but it, it allows you to find people in your neighborhood that cook more than they need for the night, and you can join their table. And there, there's a wealth of apps that exist like that that allow you to reconnect to your local community, even if you do it digitally. People have apparently become a bit less comfortable with just speaking to their neighbor, like they did in the old days. But Ironically, the digital devices allow us to reconnect. And, and when Andrew mentioned that Australia Post has always been that center of connections of communities, that's why also we think that Australia Post could be such an important player in this, because digital is the new way of, of connecting to your local community. Even if it goes via the internet in China and back, it still goes back to local. So I think actually it'll improve a lot of that further. And it'll reconnect people and perhaps make digital less, less of a of a tool that you notice, and so that you spend time on and with. If you don't have to put in the same data again, maybe we look at the devices less often as well. Thanks a lot. We, I, I guess we have the space of dating and NFRs well covered, so let's, uh, I hope the next uh, questions are not about dating anymore. Willem, uh, one question. Uh, the, the five points that you put forward, completely agree with. Uh, and we talk about the digital customer. What about the disreputable customer? The, mm -hmm. Frank from Nigeria who sends me uh, <laughs> connecting uh, points. And so I was interested where trust fitted into your framework. Well, it's a very good question again. Um, trust has become increasingly something that is not related to showing a passport or a chip, but showing that I've been interacting with others and that these others have been satisfied by the in these interactions. And if, if that platform of a digital identity works well, it will gather a picture of you that says a lot more than your degrees and, and your location or whatever, but it will also show a history of who you are, which means that if you could share snippets of that, trust would be much easier to establish. If my, if my identity captures all that I do, including a bit of good work for someone or ratings that I've gotten, trust will not be a matter of I'm in Brisbane and I have a legal passport, but it will be a matter of other people that have interacted with you have not been disappointed, have not been ripped off. And, and this is something that you already see on most platforms today. Um, and again, there's a platform for hiring yourself out on really small jobs. And there's not too much about degrees or, or real references there. There's a lot of ratings by others that have hired you for a certain job and that have been satisfied or not. And this system seems to work really well for building trust, much more than the classical approaches we, we used to know. And again, this is that shift back to the way it used to be. Because the way it used to be is you went to your neighbor, hey, you know, a good carpenter for the roof. Yeah, I've heard of this guy. He, he's, he's helped my friend really well. So it's again using your network to create that trusted environment. And that works, if you ask me. <laughs> All right, one last question here. Hi, thanks, thanks for that. Um, uh, your comment about cancelling a dinner date and sending them around to my house <laughs> to have them you know, be subjected to my <laughs> cooking um, got me thinking that um, a number of the themes that I, f I feel like I'm hearing through this is that life can somehow be reduced to algorithms and apps. Uh, <laughs> and you know, human beings only like certainty and consistency to a point. Um, and other than my thought process going to the, we're on the verge of Skynet and all those sorts of other things, how does, you know, honestly, how, how do you take into account the fact that life cannot be reduced to algorithms and apps? Because if there was, you know, an app for just about everything, then please, someone start working on the app for world peace. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a good one. Well, I think the question you really ask is about, is about how people decide to use this, right? Um, every time when you build something for people to use, they take that solution and do whatever they heart, their heart desires with that solution. And if people really want to do something, they'll find a solution. So I don't think that providing such a solution will change the way people 
do except for in the direction that they want to change. So I don't think this, that this will disrupt our, our communities in, in such extent that we have to think, oh no, I wish we didn't invent this. I don't see any danger because it's a consumer empowered platform that people can use for whatever they want to use it for. But if they don't want to do something, they won't use the platform for it. And if they want to do something, they'll find the tool, whether it's this platform or something else. Um, I hope that answers your question, although it's not an easy one. does not like to have it. Exactly. Changed. If it's a good platform, it would learn that you don't like using it. It would just <laughs> delete itself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Monica. <laughs> it's a bit like the recent movie, Ex Machina, right? Ex this app will <laughs> self-destruct in five. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Willem. If Thank I you. could have all the other speakers. Here.